What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Meran Podcast. Today, my guest is again, Paul Bergeron. For this episode, we'll start off right where we left last week. It was really good talking with Paul. He's super interesting and has a lot of insight in the ski industry in general. In this episode, we talk about injuries, traveling to Europe, switching to filmmaking, working on X Games real ski projects and winning two medals. Then a big feet injury that left him in a wheelchair for over six months. Big thank you to this episode's sponsors, Axis Board Shop, J Skis, Tree Fort Lifestyles, Decans Restaurants and Planks Clothing. Let's go. So after that pinnacle we were talking about of like going to Sammy Carlson Invitational, what happened after that? Did you get a, was that your first knee injury? My first knee injury was in Mammoth really early. I think it might have been. Was it the fall after that? Mm, yeah. Yeah. So Sammy was in the summer. So the year after, well, the fall after, yeah, uh, we went to Mammoth for early season and I blew my knee the first day I think yeah that's a so that shitty was... uh turn of event like you're kind of yeah going off at, at your peak and then right as the next season comes along and it's kind of the worst timing ever to have it on like early season because your whole season is blown up basically yeah and at this point I had some sort of uh um expectations of chances on going onto the Canadian team because I was kind of in contact with, you know, I, I skied with JF a lot, Phil that was on there at the time as well, and I knew JF Cusan a bit. So I was kind of on the verge of if I did good that year, maybe I could have gone on the team. That's a speculation, but I was at that kind of breaking point where I was there, and maybe it could have happened. And I blew my knee, I think, well, yeah, first day or second day in Mammoth that year. The first day of skiing in the full year. Then I was set off for a bit. The next year, I came back after my knee injury, which healed kind of fine. And then I did a little urban trip. I don't remember with who, but I, I kind of tore my hamstring. And that lasts for a long time. After that, I went to the that same year. I went to Tanner's Invitational on that big hip, and I couldn't land switch. I couldn't do much, and that that uh, lasts for a long time. When I tore my hamstring after that, um, so it was like two seasons in a row where kinda yeah exactly. I I blew my knee. I came back from it fairly fairly good. Landed switch in a tranny, and then I I hurt my hamstring for so long. So it's kind of two seasons where I was kind of off, you know. So, yeah. At this point already, two seasons off uh, was big at that point because things were moving fast yeah, with and teams and it was the verge of it. Yeah, and especially if you don't have, like, really financial support from companies or anything. It's exactly. Uh, I probably got, like, 3000 bucks at that point from, like, my sponsors. Like, what are you going to do with that? Yeah. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> you can... Uh tough out the winter eating peanut butter sandwiches but you can't even fly out to two different places yeah. like how are you gonna make and that's one thing i like sponsors ask a lot for what they ask for especially now i feel like after that uh there was a demo tour the inspired tour yeah how yeah. they tell me about that because that's something special that's really a great move for you guys to go out to local resorts Well, I'll, I'll let you explain it, but yeah, it's it's something unique that has not been done ever since or before that, I feel. No, uh, we had a great mentor that still is a mentor of uh, Eric Heiberg, which planned for Phil Henrik and I to go around the United States and some resorts in uh, Canada as well. And that was the Inspired Demo Tour, it was called. And we did 60 ski resort in 64, five days, I think. Um, so every day we'd, we'd drive in a van to some ski resort out east and make our way out west. And uh, we saw all the smallest places, I think, uh, in the U.S., uh, even like old trash dumps that were now covered with snow and they put a lift there and like small place that 
fucking weird but the demo tour was incredible and i think uh, it showed to lots of kids and they created the like even the the kids that were 16 back then they'll remember that when they're 40 you know because they were not flipping on me but the, henrik and phil were there and henrik had just won like We did almost half of the tour, 30-something days around the United States in the East, doing the smallest, smallest parks possible. And Henrik flew out to the X Games and won. <laughs> you know, so then he flies back with us, and he's like the X Game winner, and he goes to the smallest local hills. So, yeah. man. And the craziest thing about that, I remember it because we were filming for a Solomon Frisky TV episode at the same time is that that's the year he did his nose butter triple. Yeah. And I remember seeing it the night he, he did it, and I was like, man, what? Like, that guy is special, because mm -hmm. not only is that trick insane, but I know for a fact that he wasn't in Europe training on jumps. He was with you in the Midwest yeah. on a shitty park. Yeah. I don't even know if uh, Henrik fell doing a trick for the first time. I feel like he pictures and in his mind like he's done it for you know i feel like when you're henrik you have such a awareness of where you are in the air mm -hmm. and uh yeah, and that behind the scenes video with tanner you know when, when he's like priming him to yeah do it, yeah uh -huh. he, you, you know in his speech that there's no there's no doubt that he's gonna land it he's saying that no doubt it would be cool to win the event without having to do a triple and he's not thinking about the culture It's not about if he's, he knows, he's like, yeah, what, I know I can land it. And you're like, well, it's still a nose butter triple, but he's like, he has so much confidence in his skill. Yeah. 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 But there's a major difference between a nose butter triple and a triple 14 mute, in my opinion. In what sense? Even both might be hard nose butter triple, even though it's a triple, it's uh, something that's so unique and pointy towards, uh, I don't You know, if no one has ever done it since, I don't think so. See, so he's done something once. <laughs> he landed it. He won yeah. with it. And that tells you how much, he, how unique this was, because I'm pretty sure everyone was like, dude, you're fucked in the head. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, he, not a lot of people can do what Henrik does yeah. on a daily basis. And I've never been really good at jumps, but nose butter seems like a really risky thing like if you cut an edge or i've never been able to do it you know lots of tricks i've never been able to do and uh you know jfo master of nose butters with the stiffest keys back then cory vanular to the it's certain tricks are for certain people i guess but henry can do it also yeah he's out of the categories so sorry i branched off at the demo tour You were saying, yeah, yeah. like, Henrik got back from winning X Games. How was that, skiing with the kids? Everyone was so hyped, you know. And I'm pretty sure it seemed unreal for seemed unreal for these kids to be with that guy at this point. Um, it wasn't like he was Brad Pitt, you know. But kids were flipping out, flipping out and they didn't even understand. As much as the parents that are there are like... Who the fuck is this guy wearing the biggest clothes I've ever seen? They see him as like a bum, basically. You like, do you know what this guy did like three days ago, man? He, <laughs> there's yeah. no problem there. This guy is a fucking thing. Is he's a legend. So that's one thing that's mesmerizing about Henrik too is he doesn't care, man. Is I think even back then. Like he came to my house on a Chris on he was a yeah he was at my parents' place on Christmas with uh, Emil Grano his filmer one year, and he had bought like the biggest jeans man for someone that's 400 pounds at least and he was so stoked to wear those in a fucking you know that's the type of guy he is if he likes something he's gonna push it to the max and people are gonna recognize him or not but he's gonna make a difference in anything he does yeah that's something special about this key culture where we have kind of our own world of mm -hmm. idols that 
if you go out of the industry, like no one knows who they are. Like, I rem and there's a few guys that branch out of it into the mainstream, like Tanner Hall. If you yeah. say that name, then people know who you're talking about. But <clears throat> yeah, I had the same kind of experience writing Avila. And like when Tom Wallish was blowing up, I think it was the refresh year. And they were doing an uh, urban trip in Montreal, Quebec, whatever. And they had taken a day off to ride Avila. Man, you you should have seen that. All the kids were riding behind him. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. not stalking him, but just like mesmerized. Like, mm -hmm. Tom Wallish is here. Yeah. And it was, it, it, you would have thought someone from Hollywood was there. Yeah. That's what's great about skiing, though, because you can go ski anywhere and most of the pros are not like uh superstars in their mind at all i don't I, i don't think i've ever met someone that that was like a superstar in their their way of acting you know mm -hmm. especially in skiing you have respect for that's what's cool though man because you can be You can be the richest person, you can be the poorest person, but if you ski together and you link up together and you feel good together, it's not there's no difference whatsoever when you're skiing with someone, it's just like that that moment. And that's something that's super special, I think, because uh skiing skiers respect skiers. I hope the most they do, you know. I've yeah. always uh respected people, I think. But That's something special in skiing because it's really a bubble of a sport that's that used to be super kind of undergroundish. Now it's in, at the Olympics, but I don't think it's super understood yet still from the still mainstream, not. you know, like if my grandma watches a slope stock comp uh, contest, I don't think she'll understand any any more than yeah, before well, it was uh, in the Olympics. Yeah, I still have friends who are not clueless and they're just not that into skiing. Yeah. And they they heard the podcast and they were like, "Yeah, what what's slope style?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, like well, you hit you know, like yeah, there it's still misunderstood. Yeah, but if you say Usain Bolt, anyone's yeah. anyone knows well, what it who it is for what and yeah, for what. Yeah, for skiing you you still need to say like, "Hey, you know Sean White?" Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah for true, skiing, true. It's it's. I feel like it's stuck at that stage for like the past 10 years. <laughs> Something I'm curious about is, you had two years of injuries back to back. At one point, you were you know, with Solomon with Oakley, and then it seemed like it those years changed everything. And then after that, you were with First Drop and Apple. Yeah, what was that transition like for you? As you were saying, you were kind of at the peak of your skiing. And then I guess there wasn't much sponsor support during those injuries because going out of them, you were with different companies. Yeah. Um, at this point, I don't think... I think it was kind of clear that I was on a down path uh, in my mind, not uh, what, what I would do in the future because I traveled to Europe after quite a while. And that was, uh, in my opinion, the best part of my skiing, even though might have not been the most uh, productive but it led me to do stuff that i really enjoyed more i feel like in the end so you know i have no regrets and yeah of course it's it's uh, annoying to be hurt and to see that you can't do much more than what you're doing right now but to me uh of course it was kind of a downer for a bit because I always wanted to progress more, but in the end, I'd say that yeah, it led me to the best places that I've uh, could have been, and that's Europe for me. And now it's time for a first sponsor break. Dickens is a family-owned restaurant chain with 12 locations in the Montreal region, and I'm really stoked to have them as a sponsor. If you've never been, you have got to try it out. Their one-of-a-kind hamburgers have been favorites of mine since I was a kid. They've started selling products like their legendary sauce and they have a lot more coming out soon, so be on the lookout for that. Support companies that support skiing, support Dickens restaurants. When you talk about Europe. Yeah, I traveled for the for the B um I traveled to Switzerland to meet up with some friends and I stayed there for quite a while. I'd say it's I stayed there for almost six months. Um going around Switzerland and France. And I, I stayed, uh, one of the guy that I met randomly, uh, told me that I could stay at his place in Switzerland and, uh, Dans le Valais. 
And I was like, all right, sure, yeah. And I stayed there, and he had a car, and we traveled a, a bit everywhere, and we did lots of stuff, and with Nico Vigne as well. And that part wasn't as relevant for anybody, as, especially the sponsors for me, but at this point, it wasn't really a, a question for me. Like, I didn't care. I just felt like I was living the life at this point more than I've ever did in in the U.S. or anywhere else because I really felt like I was traveling to do my own stuff and not being not going to somewhere for a contest for example anyway. so yeah after I blew my knee it took like a fair amount of two years to come back to a point where I I didn't have to think about my knee anymore and I was definitely out of the competition but I went to Europe and that's when I felt like I fell in love with skiing again What year was that? 2014, 2015? Uh, the BNE Invitational, I went to a first one. And uh, yeah, after the second BNE, I'd say I stayed there. Uh, Candide was there. And I ended up going to his place at La Cluse for a fair bit of time. And I, I got the chance to ski with him a lot. And yeah, that was the almost towards the end of my the my skiing career not even career at this point it was just towards the end of skiing period and i got to ski with the the person that i i was inspired the most by that um it was a dream like honestly if you're in any sport any type of work uh and you have someone higher that you look up to that was my person at the very very top so I feel like I was lucky enough as a skier to, 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 to go there to La Cluse and ski with him and see how the projects that he were involved into uh, worked out. And yeah. Yeah, well, going to La Cluse to ski with Candy Tovex yeah, with yeah, him yeah. is pretty much the dream of so many skiers. It's like, I don't it's understand incredible. still. I really don't understand. Uh, I feel so lucky because I didn't ask for it really it was more of a chance uh, but still i don't know how this all lined up to be honest and do you have any footage of that time or it was all like just skiing for fun yeah. and nothing filmed mm, no i have some footage but definitely it was more of a being there man like we didn't film anything most of the time we were two or three with the as is his friend and it was really a ski time for a skier that loves skiing you know enjoying the moment so much especially coming from here like it's insane there's nothing to be thought about it i was just blown away the the, the entire time and mm. try to follow this guy it's he had a a full palette of a carlsberg beer in his uh, garage like a full palette i don't know how many beers that is but Every morning, I'd take two beers out of the pack, and I'd drink two beers on the lift on the ride way up because that would loosen me up. Because otherwise, I would not be able to follow him at all. Like, and almost one of the biggest crashes in my life was try to follow him. I had super soft skis, and I just blew out and going straight straight down on a bumpy hill. I blew out, just exploded. <laughs> So yeah, I had to I had to loosen myself up a bit because that guy is fucking insane, the fastest for sure. Yeah, the terrain he, he rides at La Cluse looks pretty intense to ride. Plus, at the speeds, I was looking at I was looking at few words the, mm -hmm. the movie project he had done, and he has a a session on jumping a big step up, and you see the in run shot of him getting his speed, but. It's really a bumpy terrain, and it looks so intense just to go down that. Yeah, it it is. And like for example, Candide will go first, and you'll you'll glide above the uh, above the top of every single bump. You'll try to do that, but you'll hit the bottom of every single bump. You know what I mean? Like you're not gliding at all, and he has that way of being light on his skis. That's a uh, unique for sure uh, not many people not nearly as a lot of people can ski like him one thing that i wanted to talk about is that 
towards the end of your career, you branched off into filmmaking, mm -hmm. which is what you're doing nowadays as a living. And it's something that you always add as a something that you were passionate about. Like from the first time I saw you, you already knew how cameras work and how editing works. Like it's not something that came in later on. Like you always that had that. One of the first big projects that you worked on in skiing is Hooligan, the JF Hool movie in my mind. Was that the first one or is there something for you before that? Well, we've always uh, we've always had a camera. We've always had, I don't recall what year it was, but Movie Maker, as soon as we were able to get that on the PC, was uh, we, were, we were on it, you know, so... We've always been creative with our footage, and we always we've always had the the chance to have a camera around, even if it wasn't me. It was uh, someone else that uh, got my scut man from back in the day. Like, uh, he had a GL2, and back then it was the we were blown away. We're like, this is the best camera ever, man! I can't believe this guy has that, and we're here. Yeah, we were creative with whatever uh, we had to do. And now it's time for a second sponsor break. Planks is a British outerwear brand founded in the French Alps. Yeah, you can ski in the UK, but you probably wouldn't. But these guys are still passionate about skiing. And as someone from Quebec, I definitely relate to that. They don't just make high quality, good looking gear that's affordable. They care about the free ski culture too, running grassroots events and sporting skiers that are some of my favorites like Woodsy, Lupe Haggerty and the Real Skiffy Crew. Make sure to check them out at planksclothing.com. Support companies that support skiing. Support Planks Clothing. So, hold again. How did that movie come about for you? Because um, it, it was a big passion project for JF. How were you yeah. involved with it? I'd say that I started to m make friend with JF when I was maybe around 16 or 17. We started because, it, again, JF was kind of a legend. Um even more so that he was from the area and he was in the biggest movies and he did backcountry and all this stuff. For me, JF was another candidate, in my opinion, in the Quebec scene. He seemed so far to reach because he was with the best at all time. He was the best man too. He was so great. He is, he still is man. But when I came friend uh, with JF, it slowly, creeped up you know we skied together and then we skied together and then at some point i don't even know how i got to make the hooligan project with gf i think it was just our friendship uh, growing up and our trust towards each other going uh, in that direction but jeff is a guy that keeps his stuff in hard drives and he like he forgets about it but at least he keeps it And his brother as well as a lot of foot footage right there from Drummondville. They used to do insane urban stuff. And back then, like crazy stuff. And they've always had that uh, that notch like to go over everybody else and in in being insane kind of. <laughs> and JF is exactly that. Like if he has an idea in mind, it's going to happen or not. But it's going to be a battle in his mind. And Oligan was kind of that, you know, like he had this bank load of footage and it's like yeah dude your career is insane but how are we gonna display that and at this point i wasn't working so much he wasn't either so we took about six months to go through this in the summertime i'm trying many different ways angles to look at it and we finally managed to do something you know that at the time um It still is an amazing project, but I, I, I see now that I was in my first years of uh, producing stuff and editing stuff that was, it's it's an amazing thing, you know, but um, there was a few flaws that we, I think we learned throughout that it's not always easy to tell a story. Like you, you, you may have the footage, you may have the, an idea, but when it's uh, to put it on the table, it's so hard to do. Mm. JF is good for that because he has a thousand ideas, um, every one, every each better than the other. So it's just a pool of ideas that you have to put together. And Oligan was exactly that. It was just a great 
great time and to work on something like definitely the hardest and the longest project i've worked on uh, i was younger and i didn't have the the skills that i have now to do this type of stuff but we got recognition for that jf as well everyone was happy and it shows well uh, how good of a skier and yeah well you managed to tell the story in a really nice way and plus in a short and concise way Mm -hmm. Like there's so much stuff to talk about for him. And I remember just his intro, like the movie is what, like 20 minutes long in total. Yeah, I think you, so. You managed to tell it all in a great way because the last five, six, seven minutes are ski porn. So basically mm -hmm. the whole storytelling is the first half. And I remember it was really like, maybe you look back at it, you look back at it now and you would change maybe some stuff. But I thought it was really Uh, original for the skiing world of like telling a story i don't know it was concise like the whole first three minutes he, you learned about his career what he liked like how he was brought up there was a montage with shots of him growing up and it told a story that could have been way longer but mm -hmm. in a nice short manner yeah um and that was kind of the battle because uh, we could have made this thing uh, 60 minutes long for sure but We managed to do it, and I think we, Jeff and I, work really, really well together. Although uh, sometimes it might be kind of a, we speak over each other not so often, you know. But when we have a point to get across, uh, we're both gonna try to get it across as much as we can and to understand each other, which is not always easy. And I've worked uh, with Jeff after Oligan uh, on his X game, and that was to me even harder to of a challenge because then you get two months to film the craziest segment you've ever done basically if you, you you're willing to win um and then again this the passion of jf drives everything of that and i don't know if you've been around jf but like He gets angry pretty often, but he doesn't. He's not angry about anybody else than than himself. And once you you get to know him, you're like, okay, yeah, uh, he's been trying for 50 times. Now he's fucking pissed. He might slam his skis on the fence, but it's it's a battle between him and the camera, and that's incredible to to become a skier and to see that behind the lens because. He will never let go. And JF, I don't, he's 32, 33 years old, 34 maybe. Sorry, JF, if I put you uh, a bit older than you are, but uh, he fights so hard. And yeah. once again, that's something that I, in skiing, it's crazy. And JF doesn't get as much recognition as he should, uh, even now, because. He does his own thing and he's passionate about it. He has the same mentality going into it, even though the tricks might be a bit smaller because now he's working and he doesn't want to break both of his leg, you know, but uh, that's fair enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And there's something about urban skiing when it might be for some setups about, you know, your natural talent, being able to do a certain trick. But for other setups, it's really about how how hard are you willing to fight for it? Like, it might take you 60 tries, 100 tries. I, I've been told that story from a couple of people, is that for his real ski, you guys went to the six kink in Shawinigan. Yeah. And that he tried something for, I don't know how many three hundred. Days. For three days, he tried the six kink. Never got it. But still, to, to not get it during two days and say, oh, yeah, I'll go for a third day is really like, okay, he's not giving up. And we drove back every time to back to Stoniam. So, you know, it's a an hour and a half drive up, an hour and a half drive down. And the hour and a half drive back uh, was never fun at this point because we never got the shot. And for Jay, I remember, man, because he's so on his emotions. And, man, I respect that so much. But when we left, he was like, I quit skiing. Of course, it wasn't be true, but... That tells you how much, pa like, it is everything that you don't get a trick and you're willing, you think about quitting everything. This is a passion that's incredible to see, even though, like, it's, it's not always funny uh, 
to be there when that happens, but it, it's part of the deal. You don't get a shot, man. We've been there for three days. Yes, you've been hiking too, but there's the old team. Like, it's easy for us to be at the bottom, but we feel kind of the 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 way he is feeling because we are skiers as well, you know. And so, if you get a if you hire a dude that never been around skiing, he's not gonna understand why you want to do that three three days in a row. But yeah, he'll be that. like, well, it's not working. Let's do something else. And for him, there's there's an emotional attachment where it's like, no, no, I'm I'm not giving up. I I, I have to do it. I don't think there's. I'm pretty sure that JF has not even five spots uh, that he can count that he left without a shot. Not even three, not even two. <laughs> Probably not a lot of spots. And that was crazy to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you guys really went all out on that segment. Yeah. Like, I'm a bit too intense in my knowledge of these things, but to me, it really stood out that, okay, well, you guys are from Quebec City. And first off, I noticed, oh, you drove all the way to New Brunswick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, what, eight, nine hour drive, 10 hour drive? Yeah, so it's yeah, like you, you're going all out to to get what you want. But uh, remember that JF is around the snowboard community a lot as well. He knows everyone in the everyone in the snowboard industry in Quebec, uh, pretty sure everywhere, but in Quebec, it's all the family of urban riders, whether as skiers or snowboarders. So we talk to each other and we know um, kind of what's going on and JF is the same to there's a certain point where in urban you have to go all out and the spots are a huge part of that and so if you're from Quebec and you keep doing the same spots over and over um, you're gonna be outdated pretty quickly but JF is always on the on the tip the iceberg uh, well the bottom of it where you don't see the spots or you haven't you've never seen this spot or that trick on this spot so you would not go to a spot to do the same trick as the guy that did uh last year the same thing you know like he's always ahead of that and there's a lot of people like it like all the urban riders that are on top that's exact. like you're not going to do the same shit as the dude that last year so mm -hmm. Jeff is always minded and truly sometimes as a friend more than a filmer it seemed dangerous uh, I say where I would not I can picture myself doing that but I would never do it but I know how it feels a bit kind of so I'm like I don't even understand how you're gonna do that so at this point I can't I can tell you to go and to do it, but I, I don't understand. Like mm -hmm. at some point, JF is too crazy and same with Emil this year. Yeah. And now it's time for another sponsor break. J Skis is a company based out of Burlington, Vermont. Their business model of making limited edition graphic skis that are sold online directly to consumer is super dope. As a fan of original graphics, I love it. They put a lot of effort into making great skis, but also in making them look super good. I finally had the chance to try out my vacation skis this spring and I gotta say I love them. They were so playful that after shooting a jump I had to go in front of the lens and hit it myself. Knowing how much time and effort Jason Leventhal and his team put into each ski they produce, I'm really looking forward to their upcoming releases. Support companies that support skiing. Support J skis. And JF wasn't he wasn't in the beginning of his career at that time. He Not was at all. You know, he wasn't um a young kid with like a reckless kid. A trick that really stood out to me was this butter six on which i don't think has ever been done before or since like it's a it's a crazy trick to do on an urban feature and the switch right to down the vertical wall uh, what's your craziest shots in your opinion from his video all of it honestly the this trip was fucked up if for example this uh let's say you're a freelancer and you're like You get the apart. Uh, someone tells you, "Hey, do you want to go shoot this for two months?" I don't know. It's impossible. You can't do that. But you have to be in it to understand it. And so every shot is particular in its own way. You know, um, 
I like for myself bigger drops and bigger trannies and stuff like that more than rails but every trick is a project on its own like I remember that tall that super tall flat rail I don't know if you recall that Jay yeah, did two on two out and B-Mail was there too and Frank Bourgeois this is a project that took two days to build with the snowboarder the like six of the snowboarder crew our crew two snowblowers like it all comes together even though that's not my favorite shot uh the the build of it was insane the yeah i forgot about that but i think that would be the craziest for me because jumping off a roof that tall of a rail it's gnarly but then to do a two-on on that yeah you're jumping off blind like what if you jump and you land two two on your nose you're falling off a big setup but uh, what i meant by that was that everything comes as a as a whole when you look at the project you can't cannot believe that it really happened hmm. when you because when you start on the first setup of the year with jf there was no snow JF had not skied all summer, basically. And then you're asked to do the craziest shit, but then you're like, all right. And after a few months, you look at the video that's done and you're like, dude, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I'm saying this be, being behind the camera, be, not being the writer. Mm. I don't understand how they deal with so much stress. You create um, something out of nothing, really. I was talking to Emil this morning about that, that for there's always something when you start off your season that you kind of take the raw stuff. Yeah. You do a couple of days skiing, you do maybe one or two urban setups that are more relaxed. But Emil was telling me, well, when you're in real ski, you don't have that luxury because you're on a tight schedule and you need to get your shots. And he was telling me that his shots from his real ski, the 270 on to transfer switch up, that was his first setup. I was thinking, okay, Your first time skiing in the year is doing that. Oh, my God. Uh, you have to have so much muscle memory. And I don't know. Uh, like I said, I've never been in that area whatsoever. Uh, but following my brother this year was the most insane thing. Because being my brother, it it was hard for me kind of to, to see this. J I felt bad with JF sometimes because the spots were insane. I, I, I really was scared kind of for uh, his health. But with my brother this year, I was like, dude. I never second doubted himself. I never said like, are you sure? Because I knew if he he was going to do this, he was going to do this because he knew. So I, I didn't want to second doubt himself ever. But behind the lance, man, sometimes I was like, You are f now crazy, man. For real, crazy. What And was like, the what was the setup that was scaring you? Everything, the most? like you said, doing having your first shot in the uh, for the real ski, your second day skiing, kind of is even that is insane. But after that, you have to build up to huge setups, man. B mill dropped uh, many stories off the roof of a building, landing down trannies and. The, so many big tricks mm -hmm. that i don't even still understand yeah uh, in uh in the mini movie they did mm -hmm. that's yeah he showed a bit more of his crashes that he had on the dam setup and there's a thing of yeah that setup is really gnarly but it's another thing of seeing that oh yeah he crashed hard a couple times Ooh. and he still went back at it And that was the craziest part because I was filming like from the far uh, facing the setup. I was filming from the far right side. And as we got there, the ice started melting and I moved around one time and my foot went through the ice and I, I was uh, waist deep in the water and I fucked up my foot pretty bad. So the entire time I was like hurting and shit and like the, the ice was so thin where he landed every time it was um, every time we're like all right now it's the time that he's gonna go into the river like and he kept going at it he was wet it, it was sketchy it was that's one thing that you can't see you see the shot you're like ah 
it wasn't my favorite trick, but uh, not me that's saying this. Like, for example, someone that's saying, oh, that was not my favorite trick. But the surroundings of it, the the guys had to go two days before build, like, a, the jump out of branches. Yeah. So it I think it's up. one of the sketchiest builds I've ever seen. Dude, bran- you have to stack up branches in order to make a flat jump, like, that's going pretty high up. And everything about that spot was fucked up. So... BML has that idea in his head and is hardly uh, taken away from what he wants, I feel like. So if he wants something, that that's because he thinks that it's possible. And mm-hmm. he's a brilliant dude, my brother. I, he's so inspiring. But when he does, man, stuff like this, I'm like, I don't understand like do your thing i'll get the shot but i don't understand i don't understand i think his medal was really well deserved but it kind of got overlooked i don't know what was like it seemed like a hackle got a lot of hype that mango got a lot of hype and i think people didn't like when you talk about the context and people say oh that's not my favorite shots and they don't realize the whole everything that went into it i don't think people realize how big everything he did was Like his cork 450 onto a roof, a metal roof. That's so big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And he does it so clean that it might be overlooked as saying, oh, well, yeah, that was a cool trick. It's like, no, no, that that thing was humongous. Yeah. And uh, uh, Mike Hornbeck wrote to me shortly after they had, uh, who was fin- uh, the podium finish. And he, he wrote to me and he was like, dude, that video was Canadian as fuck, you know. And I understood kind of what he meant by kind of JF type big setups, going big, na na na. Um, Hackle and Mango, I like those guys. Hackle goes big, Mango goes big too. But they're more into the, um, uh, the new era of Urban, which is not quite like B-Mill. Emil is like older stuff, big stuff, you know, which is not, uh, I don't take any anything away from it. Uh, but it's less of the mainstream kind of thing. Like I said earlier in the interview, uh, what BML does is less accessible to people. Mm-hmm. A lot less accessible because you're basically going to die if you're not good. That's king. Yeah. <laughs> if you try this stuff. Whereas, uh, I don't know if it was Mango Rackle going under the, like a fence and like lazy out butter. This yeah, Hackle did something of like going, uh, like kind of doing a zero switch, going on his back and then yeah. going back to switch. I respect that. But you, to me, uh, this is something that if you work a day on, you can get. Mm-hmm easily uh, well, and- it's not a diss whatsoever it's just uh, my view on urban skiing whereas the big stuff like frank bourgeois and snowboarding yeah uh, the biggest fucking hits you can do yeah the there's definitely tricks. less consequences on like let's say that trick that we're talking about the it's tech it's tech but it's it- there's the risk factor that's not there that's all yeah, yeah, yeah. and fairly it's an up uh, opinion that is fair to any other sports too that mm-hmm. you, there's always uh, different types of yeah. people that you you like more or less and i think that that's been a natural progression with people not buying ski movies as much and kind of the focus the monetary part not being that big into urban skiing where guys have no incentive to jump off roofs true i, I think that's kind of a natural progression yeah x games is kind of the only thing that gives that because Well, yeah, there's yeah, the yeah. visibility, there's the metal, there's the the money, the price purse is kind of yeah. something. It's a huge luck to have that contest for real uh, because it puts them on a... We stayed in Quebec all year and you got an X game medal and you got the recognition that it, it deserves after all. So for that, it's the only contest that's out there to to promote that in a way that's as cool as the big air at X Games, in my opinion, you know. Mm. Um, so that, yeah, they have that platform that's pretty sick. But again, being a part of that as well, uh, for me, is super, super cool. I like it.
And now it's time for another sponsor break. Tree Fort Lifestyles is a company based out of Oregon. They've been involved in the ski industry since their inception in 2011 when they made their first pair of suspenders for skiing. They produce some of the nicest accessories you can find out there for your adventure activities, whether you're going skiing, hiking or traveling. I've worn their suspenders all winter and I have to say I love them. They're stylish and they're so comfortable you forget you have them on in the first place. Go check them out at treefortlifestyles.com and use code MERAN at checkout to get 15% off your order. Support companies that support skiing. Support Tree Fort Lifestyles. When you were younger, if I were to tell you that you would have two X Games medal, but as a filmmaker, mm. what would have you thought? First of all, I would have said, what the fuck? There's going to be a <laughs> urban contest at X Games? Yeah. That, was, uh, that would have been my first thought. Uh, but let's say that 10% of the score is for the video itself. And so, yeah, it's cool to have a medal. But um, people that are the judges of that have a better knowledge of just looking at a video and being like, I don't like it because of the song, because of the cuts. They'll understand the tricks and what's behind it before they see the edits. That's why they're... That's only 10% of the score, and I think that's uh, that's really, really fair. Because let's say you're the best gear in the world, but you only found this dude to film your project that's average. It's not representative mm-hmm. because the edit sucks or the, you know. So that's cool that they do that because it gives uh, more, more, a bit more play and to be f- more fair yeah towards riders but then after the judging side a big part of the impact that this segment will have on the internet and on the culture has a big part to do with the filming editing and everything that's true that's very true and also uh which is kind of sad and not a hundred percent true i contradict myself there but if you are from the u.s i feel like you may have a bit of advantage over the social media and who you're gonna reach yeah, whereas well, for b mill that's always the case for us yeah yeah, yeah. it's always been <clears throat> it's hard as a canadian coming from quebec um there's not a lot of people to be honest if i try to think about it right now um that are still there phil Uh, ben yeah, Mal is sense. still there a bit. Vin's gone. The that are still relevant. The crew in the of people from Quebec that are still there, being Canadian and Quebecer. Yeah, not a lot of people, you know. Phil, uh, ABM, Belmar, your brother. Yeah, uh, there's a lot on the come up, but as we said, it's hard to make a name for yourself and stand out. Well, that's really the part standing out. And it's not going to be in the urban environment. Yeah, well, it seems like they don't do it. No. <laughs> When we were young, it was like kind of a thing you must do. Uh-huh. And not that you must do, like everyone wanted to do it. Everyone was into it. Yeah. I don't... I, there's some kids that are still doing it, but they're not the same that are on the Quebec team. It's two no, separate no, no, groups no. doing two separate things. Yeah. And I don't... Uh, I would not be able to say one name that's... Jacob Belanger. Jacob Belanger is the youngest, in my opinion, that's uh, grown the best out of not being in the contest scene. Mm-hmm. He has his own style. He's known in the U.S. as well a bit. You know, people start to yeah. acknowledge his uh, style. You really see the the line of influence. Like Kinda, JF yeah. influenced you. You influenced your brother. Your brother then influenced Jacob. Like, like there's a there's a path. Yeah. Yeah, it's all toward that, uh, for sure. And like I said, traveling, Jacob is put in b uh not because he's my brother, but he knows a lot of people in the in the world. Uh, he's been to Riggs Grandson in the, in the North Pole. He's been on a bus trip to Slovenia, I think it was, like with the picture team. Um, that kind of puts you in a different place as well it's totally different two vibes of skiing yeah uh, it's the relationships that you make with that 
and your brother yeah. is one of the kindest dude I've ever met. So for sure, I man. don't think there were, there would be one person he met that doesn't like him because he's like he's so genuine and so nice. Yeah, and I feel like he does skiing because he truly loves it, and he does it for the right uh, for the right reasons that are the reasons that he believes in, of course, because every reason to ski is good. Uh, And now it's time for another sponsor break. Axis Board Shop is a ski and snowboard shop based out of Saint-Sauveur, Quebec, Canada. They've been in business since 2002 and have supported skiing since day one. From sponsoring numerous athletes to putting on competitions to helping out movie productions, they've done it all. Axis is the core board shop and they've got everything that you might need this season. Check them out at axisboutique.com or go check out their shop in Saint-Sauveur. Support companies that support skiing. Support Axis Board Shop. It's just a matter of what you want to do, you know. If you're starting to stress about how is my life going to be later, am I going to ski later, and then and this is where I kind of drew the line for myself as where I, uh, as where uh, no, I don't want to struggle mentally because I'm not good enough at skiing uh, and I'm not going to make any money out of it. Mm-hmm. But like for Emil, Jacob, they have they still have a hope of going somewhere by doing what they love because man f- like Phil is an example but there's not many people uh I could not say one person that is going to take the lead of Phil in Quebec City he's, he's his own thing and no one is even close to become Phil you know in mm-hmm. in its own way so it's yeah on one side on the influence he has had And then on another, the sponsor support he has had. Like, he definitely created that with his influence and his style of skiing. But then there's also um, the industry that that gave back to him. Like, he has a pro model with Full Tilt. He has a pro model with Armada. He, But uh, let's say for Phil, he used to ski backcountry a lot, too. Like, back in the day, like, he skied backcountry... uh, He's done a lot of contests. He's done well in contests. He's done well everywhere. So he kind of proved himself where people need, uh, unfortunately, proof of you being able to do certain things mm-hmm. to be at that spot. And he, re- he really worked for it. So it's not like Phil has always been this urban dude that just does his thing and is uh, recognized for it. Like it took some years to build up, I'm sure. And for every skier in the world, uh, you don't build yourself up in a matter of minutes. And you have to do something that's... There's a reason why certain skiers are were on top but never got the recognition from the people or the love from people that they kind of deserved. Uh, yeah. Because the style wasn't there or the attitude wasn't there. If you talk to Phil, there's no way you're going to hate him. <laughs> He's not going to tell you to fuck off anytime. <laughs> yeah. And when you look at the other influential guys, Tom Wallish, Enric, they were all doing everything. Doing edits, doing movies, winning competitions. It was like you couldn't ask them to do anything more. Like Henrik right now or even in the past 10 years, due to our X Games, World Cups, movies, edits, he's doing, he's everywhere. So yeah. The best yeah. is to be on top of your game, which is not easy. But uh, mm-hmm. once you are, like these guys, uh, you have the control and you're you're able to to make what you want. And that's why they're starting to create their own clothing brand, or they dissociate from uh, brands that they used to be sponsored for uh, by, because you realize that. You can't have a certain control if you take over some certain stuff. If you have the power, of course, uh, of the industry and the people that are watching you. But that's the way to go now. And that tells a lot about skiing is like when the biggest heads of the sport are taking matter in their own hands as well as they're going to start their own brand uh, clothing companies. You're like, how is the sport really doing? You know, because those yeah. are the top guys. So that means there's not a deal out there that's interesting enough for them to to look up for. So skiing is the greatest thing 
but it's uh it's really really complex and the yeah <laughs> from, the it's a it's a spread stuff. out sport in terms of different niches and then in terms of different uh geographical location like armada are trying to appeal to people in quebec but also people in china and people in uh, mm-hmm. i don't know argentina it's it's a hard thing to market yeah we talked before on the podcast about uh when you have skiing off of your life it's kind of a drug addict with nothing else you had that happen with a crazy feet injury yeah can you tell me about it yeah the injury i was a filmer at that point for jf and that was uh, the spring right after we had done the real ski with jf and uh every year he would build a big jump at stone am his own ski resort um so we could film and so that was a big hip jump that uh he w- he had gone over a couple times and led in the landing to clear over the hip and so i followed him and uh the snow started to be a bit sticky at this point you know and i missed about a foot or two of uh the la- i landed on the knuckle basically a foot or two before the landing but a hip is pretty steep so i went pretty high up and i exploded uh my left heel my right heel uh my left ankle and uh other bones in my right uh, left foot and so of course uh, right then and there it was over so i was in the ambulance i went to the hospital i stayed at the hospital for about a month a month yeah that's long i had uh two surgeries there uh, where they fixed my left heel with 12 bolts my right heel with 10 bolts and other bones with other screws and then uh, i pretty much knew from there that it was going to be hard to come back to skiing um When I came out of the hospital, I had to be six months in bed. After that, I did some wheelchairing as well. And then six months after that, I start, uh, started walking slowly, slowly, slowly. So you were six months without walking? Yeah. Uh, uh, because how was both that my, mentally and, you know, on the, um, sur le moral? Uh, it was pretty, it was hard. It was hard, but not understood yet. Um, because when something like that happens, you don't know how it's going to affect your future life so much. And so it was like an injury. I was uh, I was living every day as every day, like every day by day uh, at this point. But then I came, I came back home, and I was in bed for six months, and I started working like crazy. I got a job for the political crew here in Montreal, and so I edited this all the the campaign for this guy that was uh, ahead of the government here in my bed, like the the entire time, like in my bed. I edited, uh, I made a lot of edits in my bed, so I kind of kept my mind working still. And then like a few months later, when I started walking again, I moved into Montreal and I worked all summer. I filmed, I edited, and then my towards the fall, my heel started to hurt very, very, very much again. So I had to go get another x-ray and my left heel was shattered again because of the, the bones didn't collide together. So the screws were there, but they had come loose because the bone didn't stick together. And so I had to move back to Quebec once again to get another bone, uh, to get a bone graft. Now this time they took all the screws. I got a bone graft on my left heel and then I had to be four months uh, on crutches again. So it took a fair like three, three solid years of me being able to deal with that and to find my way. But uh, like I say to my friends, it's the best thing that ever happened to me because before that i was just bumming around skiing which is fun cool like yeah but at a certain point age doesn't have a count but i was maybe 26 i don't know like uh, starting to wonder what's gonna happen because skiing for me was definitely not an option at this point to become to make money that's uh, that was for sure And so you start to ask yourself, what am I going to do, you know? And I knew people in Montreal that were that were based off ski, uh, that started from skiing too. 
that offered me to start work here and there, editing, um, filming and stuff. So honestly, the accident is what put me into the position where I'm in right now, where I'm living good because I, 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 I work and I work for something that I like. So it basically was the greatest thing that happened to me in a way where, you know, some people go to high school, go to Sejab, go to university to figure out what they want to do in life. And I was put into this position where, yeah, I couldn't move for a bit, but then it put me into this position where I, I, I found my way. And now I'm super happy with it. That's cool to hear. Yeah. But as a skier, your brother was telling me that skiing is not an option really for you anymore like you're um you're hurting just doing a couple laps yeah weirdly after i crashed i i tried skiing again but of course my 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 feet are much more different now um and i didn't get my boots really fit for my feet yet so every time i go i'm hurting and it's not really possible and i don't see how i can enjoy it anymore Uh, so it it kind of came off my mind to be honest to the point where now I almost wish I would live somewhere where there wouldn't be no snow um, and that's true and I would have never thought of that um, but yeah now I feel like if I can't ski to give myself some sort of adrenaline or Because I used to ski at a certain level, even if it's not jumping, it's skiing hard, going fast, uh, and I can't do that anymore. So, yeah, it's just like doing... if you're the best painter in the world, and someone asks you to draw like stick figures all day long, I'm not sure you're gonna be happy with your life. You know, so, I don't know. I just yeah. forgot about it. Well, same thing happens to me when I'm like riding with like my in-laws, and mm -hmm. they're all riding like the the usual slope and going. And I, they see me go 110%. And they're like, well, why are you so like going so fast? And I'm like, well, that that's how she goes. Like, gotta get uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no other options, really. Yeah. And um, I find myself being kind of like that with every, not everything I do, but as, as soon as I have uh, an int of interest towards something, I'm going to do it for sure, like 100%. And... The other way around, if there's one bit that I don't like, it's going to be hard to motivate me. So um, that's why I forgot about skiing. It's not even in my thoughts. I don't think about it anymore. And I found biking, and that's the greatest thing in my life right now, and that's what I want to pursue, you know. And my girlfriend, and we have plans for future life. And um, I think it's sad to say that I'm not sad to say, but growing up is not always fun. But I feel good uh, being where I'm at right now, so no stress whatsoever. Oh well, that that's the best thing to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's kind of classic, you know. Uh, you get older, you, you find a job and whatnot. But uh, I didn't find the job where I'm not happy. I didn't find the girl which I'm not happy with. I didn't. I'm here in Montreal, which is not my favorite city, but I can't complain about anything, anything at all. I'm able to walk, man, and 40 years back, if I had done that, no way they were going to be able to fix me. Now I'm walking fine. No one is ever going to be able to say that what happened to me. Like, So I'm lucky. It put me in a good spot. Uh, even better than skiing, if I look back, because uh, I have further more years to live than I did skiing. But what I'm happy with is um, at least I had a chance to travel, to meet new people. That's the different part about being, yes, you can do a sport and be competitive and wanting to win. But once you forget about that and you realize all the opportunities that you have to meet people from every country in the world, really. And I'm sure you did the same. Like you've you've met a lot of people throughout skiing that are otherwise yeah, yeah and relationships that are deep relationships like i don't know for how to sure. say it better but when you go through missions like you did with jf for his real ski it's uh kind of remind me of people in reality shows when they they're together for a month and they come out and they're they're like family yeah and they explain that well what we lived was so intense but it's kind of the same thing where 
it's not just like seeing a friend at school. You're like going through blood, sweat, and tears with a person. So, and that's what makes uh, real friendships as well, because this is kind of a make or break. You know, you you're gonna find out real fast if you're not uh, inclined to be with someone. If you're not their friends, if you don't belong together, this is gonna show up because you have so many experience, and that's all through skiing, and. It's insane. Uh, it's hard to look back. Like sometimes I look at my old videos and it seems like I've never done that. Uh, I have no like clear memory of that. It's it, it goes kind on. of seems like in a, another life. It does seem like another life. And even like my girlfriend, she doesn't know one thing about skiing. She, you know, she has no clue. Like I, she's like, oh, show me a video of you doing something. And I showed her the the Sammy Carlson. She was like, what? What? You used to? Yeah. But I had the same thing when I was like going back. I went back to school. Well, I didn't. Like I was pursuing school. And at some point doing my master's, I was with like kids do master's really fast. Like they, they end up their bachelor's degree and they go right straight up to master's. So I was like maybe five year older than them. And I would tell them about what I was doing in the skiing world and I would show them videos. And one, they didn't have a clue about what free skiing was. So first there's that. And then there's the age gap where they were like, well, that was a long time ago. So you were basically like 17, 18. And anyways, there's, there's that whole thing of like, I was seeing it through their eyes. And I was like, yeah, it seems like it's in another life. It's really, uh, it's a weird yeah. thing. <clears throat> yeah. I, uh, I think... Uh I'm 29 and I think we've we've really been lucky to be in the era that we were in when we were younger uh, as much as the kids that love skiing nowadays uh, we used to do it in a different manner of of ways like I, I have a hard time explaining this but it's it just shifted so much that it's hard now for me to even relate to any of that now that's why it seems like a different story altogether because you don't see the type of skiing that we used to do and not the type of skiing meaning the style but the events the the movies the, the i don't know yeah, it just well, seems all so big different. example for me is that if3 would be in the cinema imperial in montreal mm -hmm which I don't know how many seats they have, but I, I'd say close to a thousand maybe. Dude, the cleanest place. like Yeah, uh, an old big theater that would be jam-packed. Like it was sold out and there were even people sitting in stairs and that would be local people coming to see our amateur movies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, there was a drive in the scene that was kind of hard to relate if you weren't there at that moment. Yeah. And depending on the city you were coming from, the, everyone knew who you were. Not like a fans, but people were interested in those kind of things. Um, where like the past premieres that I've gone to in Quebec were more like lots of people wanting to party and not knowing exact at all what the movie was there is just like oh, there's a premiere people are gonna get wasted and that was more about it than the scene back then but again i sound like an old man that's like oh back in the day the shit was fucking great you know but i feel like it was definitely a different era um that we were lucky to be a part in and i was lucky to be a part in because like i said earlier i'm not i was not a contestant to be the best skier in the world i had my thing going yes uh i had my fair part of fun there but it's just it was different uh, there's no way a skier like me c could make it today i don't think maybe i'm i'm idealist but i would say yeah there's a way but yeah as we said before it's harder yeah much 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 harder <laughs> yeah well thanks for coming on the podcast i, yeah, re yeah, I really appreciate up. it Big up, big up. So stoked. That's a great initiative. Like I told you earlier, it's uh, crazy to see people really wanting to put uh, efforts into skiing and in that kind of viewpoint and inviting me too. Really, yeah. thank you, man. Cheers. Boom, boom. Bam. Ciao. So this is it for episode 13. I hope you liked it. I really enjoyed discussing with Paul. 
He's a great dude who has done a lot in skiing and I'm really looking forward to what he does next in the filmmaking side of things. Big thank you to this episode's sponsors, Axis Board Shop, J Skis, Tree Fort Lifestyles, Decans Restaurants and Planks Clothing. See you next week.